Good morning. Welcome back to Passionate World Radio Network. Distinguish yourself from the ordinary. And this morning at the International Miami Book Fair, we have the special privilege of interviewing Jonathan Balcom, who wrote a book called What a Fish Knows. So good morning, Jonathan. How are you doing this morning? Hi, Lillian. It's strange looking at the camera and not looking at you, but I'll be a good boy and do what I'm told. Well, I, you can see me peripherally. How's that? Okay. And we'll get along. Sure. Jonathan wrote a book about fish, and not just any fish, but a certain kind of fish, and introduces us to their world. So why did you want people to know what a fish knows? Well, I work for animals. I'm a biologist who specializes in animal behavior, and my career has been built around animal protection. And fishes need a lot of protection. There's also a lot of really great science about their lives, but most of it's buried away in scholarly journals that most people never see. And so as a science writer, I took it upon myself to make this information accessible to lay readers so that everybody can realize how fascinating, complex, and really cool fishes are. What do you consider the number one important thing that people really need to realize about the fish and about the fact that although everything has a birth, life, death cycle, you really can't say that about the remaining fish in the ocean these days? Yeah, what I want people to know is that uh, it's something that I've become convinced of following four years of delving into the science of what fishes do and also collecting stories from incredible stories from people who've spent time with fishes is that they really are as sophisticated, complex, as richly living their lives as the other vertebrates that we hold in high esteem, including the mammals and the birds, the furry ones and the feathery ones. Um, these, these creatures have been around for a lot longer than the other terrestrial animals. Um, they've been around for a couple of hundred million years before our ancestors crawled onto land. Um, they've had a lot of time to evolve. They've had a lot of time to develop really complex social lives and interesting sex lives and that sort of thing. So um, th they deserve a much better place at the table than we give them. And when I say place at the table, I mean and to, to be part of the discussion, not part of the meal necessarily. We often think of fishes in one of two contexts, something to eat or something uh, as a source of recreation. And we need more to do better than that. And we need to stop doing that. So if you had a way of taking a slice the way you do with an ant form, so that kids can learn about the ant colonies and how they're formed and the queen is in charge and with the working ants. What kind of fish would you put in that type of situation that you would consider a good learning experience? I might pick the cleaner fish, the, the cleaner wrasse to be more technical. This is a fish who makes a living by providing spa treatments and parasite removal services to other fishes. We collectively call the other fishes client fish because they line up to wait their turn on reefs to be serviced by cleaner fishes. So cleaner fishes make their living by plucking parasites and algae and other things off, other desire, undesirable things off the, um, off the skin of these, of these client fishes. And the clients come back for more because it's really nice. It's like a massage for them. That's how I view it. There's certainly survival benefits. It's not good to have parasites, and if these cleaners remove them, which they do, and the clients cooperate, they open their mouths, the little cleaner fish swims in the mouth with impunity, a large predatory fish, you could just snap the jaws closed and eat that cleaner, but they never do. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't benefit um, business relationships to eat your business partner. And they go inside of the gills and out of the gills, and they remove gill parasites, and they do this a lot. So the cleaner wrasse, is a very clever little fish. The cleaner wrasse remembers how long it's been since the client, that particular client last visited. They recognize individual clients. They uh, are subject to what's called audience effects. That's to say that they know who's watching. If there's a lot of clients in the queue waiting to be serviced, they do a better job. They tend to be a little shoddier if there's not many clients watching because it's thought to be that's because they have less to lose. They're not really going to be uh, affecting their, their their reputation so bad, so much if they don't don't do a good job. So it's really quite a complex social um, relationship that's built on trust and sometimes involves the deception and not doing such a good job when you when you're expected to do a good job. I find that a lot of people do not consider fish as intelligent or the ones that they deem intelligent are the dolphins and the porpoises and they give them first place and now they're seeing 
that whales and also sharks are a little bit higher on the evolutionary plane in terms of intelligence as well. But your book does point out that just because you can't see their intelligence at play the way you would with a human doesn't necessarily mean that these people, excuse me, these fish are... I don't mind if you call them people. Well, I don't mind. My, my husband's been raising fish since he was a little boy, so... And we have fish at home, and I consider them people in my, in my realm. But because most people look at fish as cold-blooded, and they're only good for one thing, and that is to be caught and then throw them back. That's what they're now doing. But they don't have brains. But that's not true, is it? No, they've got good brains, and uh, their brains can do pretty amazing things. Uh, I, I challenge anyone to swim over a, an intertidal zone at high tide and memorize the topography of the tide pools. That's something that uh, fulfin gobies do. These are little uh, five-inch long fishes of the Atlantic seaboard, and they've been observed to jump accurately from one tide pool to another at low tide. How do they do that? How do they know which way to jump and how far without ending up stranded on the rocks? Well, it turns out they memorize that tide pool zone during high tide when they're swimming over the tide. Uh, and they can look down and they make a mental map. Uh, it's something they're really very good at and it's something that's being shown that they do. And uh, they're about, uh, they're almost 100% accurate when they've had a chance to swim over that tidal zone with just one trial. If they haven't had a chance and they're forced to jump, they, they, they maybe one in seven will actually accurately hit um, a, a neighboring pond. So. Um, they, they need to be able to do that and they're very good at it and it shows that if you um, had something that's really important to you over long periods of time in evolutionary time you become good at it, you become intelligent in that particular area. That's just one example of uh, a number of cognitive skills that fishes do including uh, tool use, uh, face recognition, they even recognize their own faces and I discuss a lot of these examples in, in my book. Well, the fact that sharks raise their heads above the water to get a good eye view of what's around and may not be perfect with their type of prey. And then they've discovered now that the jellyfish are not aimless. They do not just go with the waves, but they actually pursue their prey once they see it. And they, can, they definitely propel themselves along. So what do you see for the future of fish? Well, I think the first step is raising the awareness of them. Uh, knowledge is a very powerful thing. I think knowledge fuels change, social change, revolutions. I think there is something of a revolution needed in our relationship to fishes and their ocean habitats, and freshwater habitats for that matter. Just get online and read about it. I mean, oceans are in terrible state with climate change and ocean warming, ocean acidification, microplastics. Um, fishing, discarded fishing gear, of which uh, one group estimated 680,000 tons of fishing gear are left in the oceans every year. They don't stop catching things either after we've stopped using them. Animals become entangled with them. So there's numerous problems. We've had a very rapacious, selfish relationship with the waters and the, the life there. It was estimated recently that we've lost 50% of all marine life since 1970. And I can tell you, by 1970, we'd lost a lot already. So. We need to have a new relationship. We need to take care of the oceans. They produce more than half of all the oxygen on Earth. So if you take a purely selfish view of, of life in the sea, we ought to be protecting it. So we need a different relationship. I recommend that people think about what they buy at the supermarket as one immediate step someone can take in terms of helping fishes. Uh, because a lot of the problems are related to commercial fishing and uh, we can Im immediately make an impact on that by simply not funding that those practices by what we purchase in, in, in the stores. So we all can play a role in helping fishes and helping their habitats and I hope people will do that. Now the coral is in bad shape. Even the Great Barrier Reef is now deteriorating yes. at a rapid rate except for where they have created special preserves for the coral to grow. If we lose all the coral, will that affect the fish as we know it? Absolutely. We're talking uh, ecosystems here, and ecosystems are complex networks of interdependent life forms, and coral is a very fundamental part of a lot of ocean eco the ocean ecosystem, but certainly a lot of ocean uh, communities as well. Uh, the diversity of reef fishes and other creatures living on reefs is huge, very high. Um, and so coral bleaching is a, is a great worry. I'm happy to say that there are there is at least one example of coral recovery. So when we do protect, um, we, we make a difference and things can rebound. Life is very resilient. 
But the problem is also, though, that this is a really a shared habitat. The oceans are kind of con communicating with each other. Everything's connected. So um, it, where we protect one area, if the surrounding area is not, not protected, then we still have issues. So we, we need to have a broad-scale protective attitude. We need to cut back on the um, harmful activities that we've been doing. If you were to bring your book to the elementary schools, I have done actually. Recently. Okay, terrific. So why don't you talk about that? Because that's where you're going to get the most immediate relief. Lillian and I were talking just before this uh, Facebook live cast about the importance of reaching younger people. Uh, younger people are tomorrow's leaders, tomorrow's decision makers, and so it's very important that we plant seeds of compassion and, and respect for nature and animal life and each other. I think those are all going in connected, they're interconnected. It's, this is not just being, being good for animals isn't like a sacrifice. It's important for our own societies because compassionate, caring societies um, are built on broad principles of ethics of concern for others. So when we go into schools, uh, which I've done and I hope to continue to do, and speak to young people, obviously you tailor your message to them. You don't use the big language that you might use sometimes in a scientific textbook, which I, I don't generally use in my book either because it's important to read, not, not reach non-scientists. But you reach them through simple messages that are um, new, that are interesting, and make them connect and relate to these, these creatures as individuals, not just alive, but with lives, not just with biology, but with biographies. And so uh, then they can connect to that. And, you know, I remember experiences I had as a child, they affect me for the rest of my life. Not many of them, I mean, you, you forget a lot of them, but they're really formative. So it's very important we reach younger generations. Okay, Jonathan, this is your brag time. You can tell people what other activities you're going to be involved in here down at the International Miami Book Fair and what other things that are coming up after the book fair, where your book is going to be, where you're going to be. Yeah, I'm delighted to be here. I'll be speaking today at noon uh, with uh, another writer, Priyam um, Natrajan, who's done a book on the cosmos. So we're going from the ocean depths to the outer uh, skies. And uh, I'm delighted to be co-presenting with her at noon today here at the Miami Books Fair. I'm told it's the third largest book festival in the country, so um, very impressive. I think there's over 300 authors here and uh, many thousands of the, the, the reading public who are here as well. So I'm going to do my presentation, sign some books, and then um, take in some of the other authors' presentations this afternoon and tomorrow. And I'm, I'm delighted to be part of it. And where can they find your book should they wish to buy it? Yeah, my book's widely available. You can find it, just type it in online, What a Fish Knows, or you can go to my website, www.jonathanbalcom.com, and order it through there, and, and my earlier books as well. So um, easy to find, and uh, very um, a very popular book, I'm happy to say. Well, there's some other books out. I read a book earlier this year about an author who pretended, and he actually went out into the environment to pretend he was a badger, a deer and a wolf and he went out to the environments and he pretended he was the animal and actually dug their holes and ate their food and, mm. and it was fascinating because you really don't get this type of information in a biology book or even in a science book because most of them write it from the comfort of their living room. That's a great angle as an ethologist, one who studies animal behavior, one of the tenets of my field is, you, is at least how I think of it, is trying to put myself in the place of the animal. Try to perceive the world as they do. I, I can't escape the fact that I'm a human, but I can at least um, have that imagination to think about the challenges for an animal for their perspective. Um, I love what D.H. Uh, Lawrence, the poet, said about fish, your life a sluice of sensation along your side. Somehow that captures the physical environment of a fish. However, he also thought they lived lives alone. They were eternally unconnected to others, but in fact fishes do actually rub up against each other and touch each other, and they appear to derive pleasure from that, sharks included. Yes, I know when they finally figured out that sh sharks do go to sleep occasionally and close their eyes even yes. more occasionally, but they do rest. There's only one or two of the species that need to keep continually swimming so then they do not drown. Yeah, there's even one species called a sleeper shark. Uh, definitely sharks, uh, new, new reputations arising. I mean, it's hard to, to get over the old reputation that sharks had, but we need to get over that. You can watch YouTube videos of tiger sharks, wild tiger sharks having their faces rubbed 
which they love having done. And there's more and more divers now who are going down there with sharks and spending time with them and uh, massaging them and getting them super relaxed, cutting hooks out of their faces. They often have hooks embedded in their, in their mouths, which is uh, painful and unpleasant for them. And so you, people take bolt cutters down. People who are used to this maybe don't do this at home. Uh, and they wear protective gear, but that's not because sharks are slavering horrible animals trying to bite and kill us. It's just because they have sharp teeth and they sometimes make, uh, make mistakes. Even though this is not in your book, I wanted to get your reaction to people who go into the water and catch certain fish to buy and sell on the open market. Sometimes it is the black market for when they sell, and these are for people who have the big see aquariums either in their home or in their car or wherever and how do you feel about things like that? Well through my uh, long-term affiliation with the Humane Society of the United States and Humane Society International and now with Humane Society Institute for Science and Policy how's that for a mouthful? Uh, I'm, mouthful. I'm aware of these issues and certainly the exotic uh, animal trade is a huge one many billions of dollars a year and it's one that uh, causes a great deal of harm to many animals in their habitats and certainly oceans and fishes are no exception there. People right now out there with uh, cyanide poisoning, uh, explosives and other destructive methods that are used to collect fishes off their reefs. It's estimated that one in ten fishes caught on a reef ends up still alive by the time it gets to the aquarium and after one year only one in ten of those is still alive. So if you do the math you've got about a one in a hundred chance of a fish still being alive after initial collection on reefs one year after the collection. It's a, it's a really harmful, damaging thing. So we encourage people to not go and buy fishes at aquariums, um, but to go and admire them in their na native habitats if you can, or read about them or watch them. You can watch beautiful videos of reefs now. Um, I, I watch them. There's, there's some great ones uh, you can find on YouTube. So are also on the National Geographic. Yes. I spend a lot of time because I know those are places I'll never go, and no, thank you, I do not want to go in a shark cage <laughs> to see a great white come up close to me. Oh, I kind of do. I have to admit Well, like you sort of do. I mean, I like sharks way before they became fashionable, and then go on to all this hoopla on TV now with the shark week and this and that and everything else. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great, but I liked hammerheads since I was around eight or nine years old. I was always intrigued by the type of head that they were Amazing. given and how they were able to maneuver with it and still hold their own with, say, you know, a great white. And I was also fascinated when they had a killer whale go up against a great white and you find out that the killer whale had made the deduction that if they flip the shark over on their back that it goes into its trance and it's easier for them to hmm. kill it. I'd not heard of that. And I was fascinated about that. I did read recently that um, humpback whales have repeatedly now been witnessed rescuing sea lions and seals from orcas, from killer whales. Orcas are brilliant hunters and they cooperatively hunt. They make waves to knock these seals off of ice floes where the seal has taken refuge to try to escape the orcas. Um, and when sometimes if a humpback happens upon this scene, the humpback intervenes, gets in the way, gets between the orcas and the seal, and will actually carry the seal on the humpback's belly, will flip over onto his or her back. And there's a dramatic photo by one scientist studying this, and it's been published now that this is a, a real phenomenon that's been witnessed uh, probably over a hundred times now. Uh, it's probably going on, been going on for a long time. It, it obviously leaves the question why they're doing it, and there's some interesting theories about that. But it's a fascinating behavior that suggests virtue, which is a... Um, a growing uh, an area of, uh, that we're aware of that animals do engage in is virtuous behavior, quite widespread. And also I think probably bullying. I think that could be an issue as well where their humpback takes a look at the orca and they hunt in packs and they always attack. There's six, seven, eight of them against one little sea lion and a lot of the times they're training their young on how to kill, which is okay. I mean, they have to live too, yes. but you kind of wonder, can the orca is a very smart fish too. Which are? The orca. Orca. The killer yeah, well, whales. They're, of course, they're mammals. Uh, they're mammals, yes. Marine people mammals forget that. Have, yes, yeah, and they have huge brains, much bigger brains than we have. And of course, they evolved in such a different habitat. We, we there's still a lot of mystery about what's going on. They seem to understand our language better than we theirs so far. Absolutely. So, what do you think about the jellyfish taking inhabiting the oceans? That's been a 
cry for I think 10 years now that in, once you fish out everything that the jellyfish are now occupying areas of the sea that they did not occupy before. Yeah, we've many people have now heard of the term dead zone. These areas of uh, the Mediterranean Sea, or I meant to say the Caribbean, but I don't know about the Mediterranean, but certainly there's some large zones in some of the oceans and seas that are almost devoid of life. Jellyfishes seem to be the ones who are most tolerant of these zones, so there are areas where jellyfishes have proliferated, and it's probably just a real clear sync signal that things are out of balance, they're out of whack. And um, I haven't read recently about that, but I'm sure there's some, a lot of speculation on how we, how we need to address that. But uh, really the broad thing about how to address is we, we can't continue consuming at the rate we have. You know, something that's just left off the agenda all the time, I'm just going to mention it here. It's a little separate, but uh, human overpopulation, it's just not being talked about. It's not politically expedient to talk about it if you're a politician. It needs to be. To be pro-human, we need to be thinking about having not having quite so many people. It, you know, the, all of the problems that are associated with nature and human problems, they're ultimately linked to human overpopulation. And so we have to start addressing that issue because it touches all of the other issues. And people are afraid to. I mean, originally China put in a one-child family for, for exactly that reason, and now I understand they're sort of getting a little bit lenient. But uh, even in the United States, I remember living in New York, New Jersey, and I hadn't been back for a long time, and I went into the city, and I could not believe how many more people were walking around the streets. Yeah, and I, and I don't think, uh, you know, the Chinese policy is, is sort of draconian. I don't think those kinds of approaches work. You can't force people. What you do is you build from the ground up. You educate people. You make them aware of these issues. You show them that l the quality of life is better if we don't have a crowded planet. And so once people buy into that idea, then I think you, you have real progress, and then it becomes part of our thinking. And then you will maybe have legislation that is, that is responsive to that instead of the kind of retro, reverse type of stuff, the kind of thing that's going on right now, where, where you know, Planned Parenthood and those sorts of things are being defunded. Um, we need the opposite kind of trends, we need, but we also need public education and awareness of these issues. So, Jonathan, if you were going to leave with a word of warning or a word of advice for your audience, what would you say? A word of advice would be um, the planet's yours to live on. You know, we, have, we live on this planet and we hope to live a long time. And we want a good planet, we want a healthy planet, and we all can play a role in doing that. It's, it's not for somebody else to do. We all need to be individually responsible for that. Great. Well, thank you all very much for listening to Passionate World Radio Network. You just listened to Jonathan Balcombe, who wrote the book, What a Fish Knows, here at the International Miami Book Fair. And you can hear and see this video with Jonathan all over again on facebook.com forward slash PWR network at twitter.com forward slash at caldwell c-a-u-l-d-w-e-l-l -L, youtube.com forward slash pwr network and you can also see it at https colon forward slash forward slash passionate world radio network dot com thank you all very much for joining us this morning and listening and we'll be back soon thank you